guys, so I'm going to talk to you guys about dog play behaviors. Um, first, I'll introduce the two dogs since they're mine. So the white one is Kyra, the brown one, wherever he is, is Subaru. Um, they are both Shiba Inus, um, purebred. Their information is yeah, the on that whiteboard there, weight and so forth. Yep. So, um, yeah, dog play behavior. So just a really quick disclaimer, all dog behaviors, no two dogs are the same, um, and you're going to know your dog the best, so just what's presented in this does not mean that you're, like, that behavior means the exact same thing in every dog. Um, and then a little bit of background of why I'm presenting this, so I uh, have been working at Klondike Kena Academy here in West Lafayette for about six months now as a playgroup monitor, so I've been trained by professional dog trainers and a behaviorist of how to um, monitor dog play and look for behaviors that are good and bad and then be able to intervene with dogs who might need help. So first I'm going to go through some play styles. So all dogs have a specific kind of play style. There's four main and then four secondary. So you have rough and tumble dogs who enjoy to wrestle. They don't mind body contact. Most of the time it's going to be a lot of body contact with rough and tumble dogs. Then you're going to have your runners, who are dogs who enjoy chase-based games, so dogs chasing after one another or dogs chasing after a toy, such as playing fetch. Um, there may be a little bit of body contact, but it's not going to be as much as your rough and tumble. <coughs> then you have your gentle players, um, who are generally your puppy and senior dogs. Maybe sometimes you're scared or uncertain dogs. You're going to see a lot of like ground plays. So they'll be laying on the ground, biting at each other or pawing. Then you have your reactive dogs, and these can be dogs that are reactive to pretty much anything, dogs, people, um, or certain behaviors. You want to pair these dogs with tolerable dogs. So Kyra, the white one, she is dog reactive. I cannot put her with other dogs other than Subaru. She does not enjoy their company. So then some secondary play styles that you can see are bear play. Um, you're going to typically see this in your bully breeds. This picture here depicts a little bit of bear play. It's, they basically are going to be standing on their back hind legs. Um, and kind of wrestling with each other like you would see in bears. This is a very um, high energy play and can quickly transition to aggression. So this is a really good play to like make sure you're monitoring between your dogs and another dog. And then you have proximity sensitive dogs. These are going to be mostly your runner dogs. This is going to be a secondary thing for them. They're going to be uncomfortable with dogs that are in their face or too much body contact. Subri Subi is a proximity sensitive dog. He does not like in your face dogs. Playstyle deficit dogs are dogs that have had social skills. They've built social skills, but they do not always read appeasement gestures or cutoff cues. Appeasement gestures are like licking of the face, um, excessive sniffing, gestures where another dog is like, please be my friend. And cutoff cues are when a dog is saying, hey, I don't want to play anymore. These dogs are going to escalate play generally into an aggression mode. Um, so you want to make sure that if your dog does have a playstyle deficit, that you monitor their play also. And then you have your awkward dogs. Um, these are dogs that are known to mount pretty much just their entire time of play. This is about the only thing that they know how to do. It's what they enjoy to do. And you have to normally get another dog that's tolerable for a dog that's just going to mount. And Tarzans. And Tarzans are dogs that do not have any social skills. They're going to come in really strong. We see this in puppies a lot without when they don't have social skills. But you can also see in adult dogs that have not been socialized very well. So moving into actual behaviors, um, we have good greeting behaviors versus our bad greeting behaviors. Our good greeting behaviors is going to be that yin yang. I'm pretty sure everybody knows what that is. It's kind of most of the time um, nose to butt, kind of potentially circling. circling. You're going to have loose, wagging, neutral tail, a relaxed body. You kind of want to see a C shaped in your C shaped in your dog's body, and some slow movements. Bad green behaviors is a head-on approach, coming face to face with each other, pilar erection, which is the erection of hairs. This generally is going to occur on the base of the tail um, or the shoulder base. Um, in some dogs, like Kyra, she can get that whole orange stripe. If you happen to see her, will be standing straight up. Um, flagged tail, sustained eye contact, and barking can be just any kind of barking or excessive barking. So this is that yin yang this is a very apparent yin yang this is also a yin yang that you're going to see here um, they kind of have like nice curved bodies they're not a head on and then here we're going to watch bad semi bad greeting so we see the golden retriever here is running up there is a dalmatian that's coming up here you can see he's very stiff slow movements he's got a flagged tail he's going to do this paw raise he does a little bit of lip licking he's trying to tell this golden retriever hey 
get out of my space, I don't like you. Golden Retriever doesn't back down, and so he does do a four-leg jab to push the Golden Retriever out of the way. So you saw the Golden Retriever did have a little bit of a wagging neutral tail, but the Dalmatian was just not receptive of this. Neither one of them were backing down, and the Dalmatian escalated and then broke away, which is good um, to, to know that he is okay with breaking away after completing these behaviors. So moving into cutoff cues, these are cues that you're going to see in dogs who are tired of playing. They want to take a break. Um, so this generally happens, they'll be playing, they'll be playing, and then they'll do a cue saying, hey, I want to take a break. These can include ground sniffing, fence sitting, checking in with the owner, just looking at the owner, or even coming up to the owner and sitting with them, doing a wet dog shake off, sitting or lying down, and especially quick downs. Um, these also can be seen if a dog just goes over and uh, starts drinking out of the water bowl. Um, that's a cutoff cue. So some good play behaviors includes hip nudges and loose curved bodies. I do have a video with these. Um, pinning with quick releases, um, self-handicapping, and role reversals. Role reversals is switching from dominant to submissive roles. So if they're wrestling, one dog will be on top, the other on the bottom, and then they will switch to the other dog being on top and then on the bottom. Self-handicapping or self-limiting um, is something that even we as humans do with children. And it basically is making it kind of fair play. So we can see here there's a toy breed dog and then a non-toy breed dog. But this dog doesn't ever stand up and make it to his full potential height to make it fair for this dog to be playing with him. We can also see this when dogs will slow down for other dogs that, they, that are not as fast as them. Or if they're playing like a tug game, they're not going to pull as hard. So some fear, stress, and uncertain behaviors that you can see is... Stiff posture, um, yawning, panting, especially when it's not hot or they haven't been playing that often or that much. Whale eye or wide eye, you're going to see the whites of their eyes, a low or tucked tail, bunny ears, and airplane ears. So again, so here, um, Kato does a really good job with bunny ears. You can see him here. Bunny ears will lay flat on their head. Um, and then Dash does a really good job with airplane ears. They kind of stick out like uh, the wings on an airplane. Um, and you can see here, even further in her body language, she has a uh, tail that's kind of sticking straight out. She's got wide eyes here. Um, and then even here, we can see again the airplane ears and more bunny ears. So then talking about tail position, um, I'm going to mainly focus on these three here, the relaxed dog, um, which just a body as a whole. He had, this dog has his weight in all four paws, head is up. Ears are neutral, tail is also neutral, so this is a dog that is obviously relaxed. When you have an alert dog, um, this dog may not be like an aggressive dog, but he is very um, uncertain, not really sure how to feel, so you're gonna have a flagged tail. The, this tail may wag, it's not a good wag. It is a, I don't really know how to feel, so this is like the body language that I'm going to do. You can see here in this picture, it does show some piloerection. And this dog's body weight is all in its is going to be mostly in its front feet. Um, he's kind of going to be rocking himself forward to make him look taller, a little bit more intimidating. He's going to try to uh, broaden his chest out, just make him himself look tall. We kind of call this tall dog um, for obvious reasons. And then this is a dog that is might be defensive. This dog you might see actually lunge at somebody. So you have a tail that's sticking straight out. The body weight is actually going to be more in the back legs than in the front, and this is so that if they do feel the need to um, attack or run away, they are able to easily make that transition. So some bad play behaviors that we um, try not to let our dogs do is pinning without release. It's okay for a dog to pin a dog for 10 to 15 seconds, but you do want to let that dog um, get up. So dogs that just lie down on other dogs or will just hold them down is not a good behavior. Standing over the other dogs, so we see that in this picture, this corgi is standing over this doodle. Um, this would not be good. This is kind of seen as a bullying behavior. The four-leg jab, which we saw in the Dalmatian, and muzzle punching, which is exactly what it sounds like. They basically take their noses and will punch another dog. Um, sustained chase without breaks. Um, this can lead to the uh, dog being chased to become very scared as they're just going to tip into fear and be running for fear, not because it's fun anymore. 
Um, any kind of nipping, mostly you're going to see this at nipping at legs or nipping at the hind end. This is also seen with Chase. If the dog starts to get frustrated that they can't catch the dog that they are chasing, you're going to start to see this. And predatory sequencing. Um, the sequence is scan, freeze, charge, and grab. And then this picture here is featuring head over shoulders, which is kind of another um, standing over dog. We are going to see this a lot, and then this black dog will end up mounting the whippet here. This is generally a behavior you're seeing before mounting. So here we actually have the predatory sequencing. So this husky is trying to hunt the German Shepherd. Um, so you see the German Shepherd's looking away, and that is his cutoff cue of, I don't really like this, I'm kind of uncomfortable, I'm not going to look at you. He's going to walk away, and then you see the Husky goes after him, and the German Shepherd does a quick down. He's like, whoa, don't like this, I'm going to lie down as quickly as possible to make you stop. And then you can see his tail's still moving, but he's very uncertain. You can tell that in the way his ears are sitting, and the rest of his body language, and now it's turned into actual good play. Even in here, you can see a little bit of like a hip nudge with the German Shepherd, how he will hit the Husky with his hips here, and that's a good behavior. So unwanted behaviors, these are behaviors that we do not want dogs to rehearse at all, um, is predatory drift. This is when dogs will, who are bred for breeding will drift into predator behaviors. Um, so the predatory sequencing can be the start of predatory drift. Um, but these are behaviors that we really don't want. We see these with dogs that might be watching small toy breed dogs that look like squirrels, not dogs. Mm -hmm. Another behavior is resource guarding. Um, these can be pretty much any resource the dog wants. It can be owner's attention, treats or food, the water bowl, toys. Uh, we even see resource guarding in uh, clumps of mud and grass. So dogs get very particular on what's theirs. And then we have fence running or fence fighting. Um, this is basically when dogs will just kind of fixate on the fence and the dog that's on the other side of the fence and they'll just run up and down. Um, this is not a really good behavior. It's kind of a fixation behavior. And then repeated mounting and fixation. Um, again, you don't really want your dog to fixate on another dog. It can make the other dog scared or it can make your dog scared. If it's being the one that's being fixated on, it's nice to kind of try to get your dog's attention somewhere else. So in this picture, we'll see Bear and Hank do really good ball play. And then Bear gets frustrated because Hank no longer wants to play with him, so he starts to mount him. So mounting, 10% of mounting is due to sex, sexual motivations. 90% of mounting is due to some other motivation. Most of the time, it's they want attention or they're frustrated. Um, it also is not really shown as a dominance thing. Um, most of the time, if you have a neutered male, six months and the testosterone is gone, so at that point, dominance isn't even a factor. So in this video, Bear is had just been recently neutered, so this may be a little bit of dominance, but for the most part, it's because Hank stopped playing with him and he got frustrated with that. So we're going to watch, I have a few more videos of some behaviors. So this is AJ and Bert. We're going to watch Bert do some cutoff cues with checking in the owner, doing a little bit of side eye with AJ here. Not so sure. AJ's doing a play bow. Yep, more checking with the owner. He's got right here, you can see the pile of erection and a hip <laughs> nudge. And then AJ realizes, oh, he doesn't want to play with me. I'll go and break off with the owner and get some attention. So these are good behaviors AJ tried, realized that Bert didn't want to play, and then broke off and did something else. So here, you can't really tell, there's two dogs here. Um, Echo is right here, and then Riley is the golden retriever in the back. Echo does a lot of leg biting, if you pay attention. And Riley is in the defense, or in the, yeah, defensive. She doesn't really want to play with Echo. When he finally breaks off, she decides, hey, I do want to play, and starts doing some four leg jabs on him. So that behavior is actually okay. She's trying to initiate play again. If it's done in an um, aggressive way, which you'll normally tell by other body behaviors, then you kind of want to stop the four-leg four leg jabbing. So how to help your dog's play experience. Um, most importantly is to know your own dog's body language and their cues and what they're trying to tell you and the other dog. 
Another thing is to know other basic body language cues so that you can read another dog's body language. Um, sometimes other owners are not as educated, so they're like, oh, they like this, and they don't. Um, and then knowing how and when to safely intervene in play. So this is knowing your dog's cutoff cues and potentially knowing other cutoff cues that dogs can show. Um, it's important that if a dog wants to take a break, you allow that dog to take a break. Otherwise, the play can uh, escalate into aggression. So if your dog is being excessive and a dog wants to take a break, go in and get your dog's attention. If your dog wants to take a break and the other dog is no, like saying no, then going and like helping your dog get away from the dog. And then how to break up fights. So I have a couple of safety tips for fights if you are ever in off-leash dog play and something happens. Most of the time, most dogs' fights do not actually end, in, end up in like uh, biting. Most dogs are not looking to fight unless you have a like, reactive dog. So can somebody get in my dogs? <laughs> Zumi, come here. Zumi, come here. So the first tip I have is um, if your dog ever does get into a fight, you never want to grab collars. Um, you never want to put your hands in this general vicinity of your dog because you're closer to the mouth. Um, there's two reasons. One, because you're closer to the mouth, but also to um, redirect. So dogs will redirect either to you or potentially to the dog in front of them. So they're going to redirect their energy back at you and potentially bite you. Or um, we do have one dog that if we grab collars, he actually gets more aggressive towards the dog that he already has an issue with. I'm going to stick him up here. And then the second thing is, um, so if you can't grab collars, where do you grab? You're going to grab back here, hello on the hips. So you grab like right on their back hips. This is one of the best ways to stop a dog who's chasing and needs to be stopped, but it also gives you more leverage because you're covering a bigger part of their body um, and it's away from everything else. Most of, dogs, most of the time dogs don't fight with their butts, they fight with their faces. And um, you're also able to do a quick grab and then a release and then a grab again in case your dog does do a redirect towards you. And that's all I have. So okay, let's give her a soft questions. round of applause. And then I'll let you point to anybody that has questions or comments. Questions or comments? Sure. I'll let you point. There's one over there. Oh, yeah. um, I've dealt with some dangerous dog interactions before. And I've seen that dogs will be generally spray that in their nose and they will release. You can also get like a bite stick to help release them. Obviously if the dogs are locked in you do not want to be trying to pull them apart because that can cause even worse injuries. Um, but we, I have never actually seen a full on dog fight um, where they've actually like punctured skin um, since I've been working there. I think it's really important that you do mitigate the behavior so that it doesn't ever escalate to that. Um, most of the time your dogs are going to give you a lot of cues saying, hey, I'm getting really uncomfortable, and then they'll like escort a little bit more, and they'll be like, hey, I'm really uncomfortable, and then even further, if you don't stop the behavior, then they're like, okay, then attacking is the only way I can get this to stop, so that is what I'm going to do. Yeah, it wasn't my dog, it was a group of dogs at a local and sometimes those happen so spontaneously, yes. you don't have your stuff along. I'll let you point again. Um, well, so I was just going to say off of that, I did dog training at home with like 4-H and all that stuff. And we were always told that if there's like a spontaneous fight and you don't feel comfortable going in to grab them, or they're locked on, if you have water or a hose, mm -hmm. if you spray water on them, they'll... Yeah. Like yeah. Like Pretty much anything ways. that might redirect their attention, even mm -hmm. clapping, loud noises. Um, we carry whistles. Whistles help mm -hmm. distract them. It's some. It's another stimulus that they're like, "Hey, what is that?" kind of thing, and it holds their attention away from um, the like another dog. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are things that happen. Now, my wife and I go bike riding out in the country, and have you ever seen those? I should bring it. <laughs> Got a race going here. 
Have you ever seen those big uh, fog horns they sell at Walmart? They've got a, like a red top and there's a compressed can underneath. The air horn. The air horn, but it's like the small ones don't work well. I should bring what we use. Our rule is we never honk at the dog unless it's coming at us on the road. You know, if it on the end of their property, that's not a problem. I felt sorry for one time for my for a big Great Dane that came up to my wife and she actually it was like this close and they're so loud it is really st I don't I should bring it because the Great Dane cried and turned around and left I mean it was such a it's got to be something sudden like you say mm -hmm. now what about the uh, the thing you spray on them is that found at dog stores or dog pet stores Citronella? yeah Citronella? I'm sure you can find that even at like Lowe's or Home Depot and it's a liquid it's spray it's an insect repellent right yes yeah, yeah. But it's a they don't like the Citronella candles I'm pretty sure yeah. it repels mosquitoes right but dogs do not like the scent of Citronella but so. you'd have it in a liquid form yeah how about if it gets in their eyes is that a problem no okay I don't think okay so. I, I mean I like having one of the, that idea and spraying it right on their nose. Although, in an instance where we would only ever use citronella if the dog was like locked on, mm -hmm. so in that case, I think we're not really worried too much about whether you know it's going to be taste bad or potentially like right. in their eyes. We're more like, hey, let's get you guys. Unlocked. Well, right. I'm just thinking of damage. You know, how do you explain yeah. to an owner you sprayed something in their eyes that are you know causing damage? But yeah, I like that. Um, I've been bitten by uh, dogs twice. But they've always been my dogs when I tried to break up a fight mm -hmm. when they were going to bite another dog. And I had my arm in the way, right? Um, what, any advice for, you know, the 911 people get these calls. A woman screaming on the phone, the neighbor's big dog has my toddler in its jaws. What, anything, do you guys get any training on that? Um, no, no, not really. I. Because that wouldn't happen where you're at. Yeah. You've just got adults and yeah. dogs. Yeah. The only thing I would definitely say is just getting like the dog. I mean, you can pretty much always hold the back end of the dog pretty well. Mm -hmm. as long but as it's already really... clamped on to the baby. Mm -hmm. Well, getting him to stop potentially even doing like the shaking motion um, by holding onto the hips would help. Um, but releasing, I would say it's probably about the same thing, trying to get a some sort of bite stick, which could be just a <coughs> branch even. Okay. It doesn't have to be an actual bite stick in there. And you put um, that in their mouth, are you yeah, saying? Yeah, and it will pry their teeth open. Okay, okay. Um, or their mouth open, right. or doing some sort of spray, or getting right. like loud noises to get their attention away from what they have. Right, because last year somebody was visiting and they were like dog safety, and they said they were trained to go down and choke the dog. Like get it right here and choke it. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, this always happens, you know, at the where the, when you least expect it. Um, yeah, and I mean, it's terrible. You read these things, and the dogs, the the babies die from blood loss because oftentimes their jugular is cut, and then boom, gone. Um, I've also heard they choke them if they're locked mm -hmm. onto something. Um, the method I was told to use is like using a belt, because like you said, yeah. you put your hand by the collar, mm -hmm. and that method would give you. A yeah. little bit more distance and or freedom. even a leash yep. if you don't have like a yeah. belt. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's I always wear a belt that uh, can be used as a leash. Like uh, if I find a dog running around, I can have a leash. Or if I ran into something, God forbid, I never do. But if there's some child, because children are very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You know, big dogs sometimes don't understand what child is. It's a great topic. Uh, do we still have time for more questions? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Because, right. I mean, see, why would we want to break off this, right? I mean, we still have two more, but. We'll see if somebody can, else can wait later. Go ahead. Uh, what do you do about dogs with general antisocial behavior? At least with my dog, ever since he was a puppy, he just likes hiding under things, and that's how he'll use to like disengage playtime. He really doesn't play with other dogs much, and that might be a socialization issue. Uh, but how do you guys personally... At the place you work, how do you guys typically work with dogs like that that just won't... Like won't get out of their comfort zone. Well. Yeah. Um. So, uh, first off, it's kind of like a misconception that all dogs like to play with other dogs. Not all dogs are dog dogs. Um, not all dogs enjoy play. So, um, it could just be that you have a dog that just really doesn't like to play, and that's perfectly fine. If you can find a way to keep your dog mentally and physically um, active, then you don't have to make them play with another dog. 
Um, what we kind of do is because we have so many different zones at where I work, um, we're able to kind of integrate dogs into really small zones. Mm -hmm. And we have so many different kind of dogs that come through um, with different play styles, different behaviors that we see. Um, so most of the time we do have a dog that we would be able to put with a slower going dog. Um, and just kind of make them comfortable with play. You just have to really make the interactions good. If there's any bad interactions, removing them from the situation um, is going to be best because you don't want them to be scared of play. You also don't want them to rehearse bad behavior. So if you consider hiding under the cot a bad behavior, you don't want your dog to do that, but you want to make them comfortable without it. And you don't want to block off the couch because that's just going to make them scared. But <laughs> but you want to like give them another option of something to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are great points. There's another one too. What can you do to ensure a successful introduction between dogs who don't know each other? Yeah, um, so we mostly will bring a dog into a zone by themselves. The zone will be empty, they'll go into a zone, it'll be a smaller zone. Um, and, um, and you guys can kind of do this. Most dog parks have like an introduction zone, and so you should really use that zone. Don't just open both doors and let all dogs integrate together. Um, let them do some fence sniffing, um, and then once that dog kind of gets a lay of the area, you can go ahead and introduce one dog that you think might enter. You want pretty much a dog that's pretty uh, tolerable and um, secure in the way that they feel about themselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, so then you just kind of want to slowly integrate dogs, see how it goes. If a dog doesn't work out, most of the time you're going to see that it isn't going to always like start off with a fight. Um, and then you can just kind of separate them and start with a new dog. Um, if it's really not working out, then you just kind of know your dog isn't really good. I cannot take Kyra to dog parks. Just does not work out. So um, Subi, though, loves to go to the dog park and interact with other dogs, um, as long as they are not wrestling him, basically. So. These, are, these are great points. I always call it, because everything's like, um, blends the behavior changes and blends into something else and when i i've had two strange dogs in my classes uh and i always we never let the leashes off we let them look at each other for a while you know get the idea and then if they're playing but i say don't let them cross the line mm -hmm. there's like this line that if they're playing and then some both of them are getting a little rough you can kind of tell and then okay now we break them up because there's this line that you can cross and then you're into some territory that it's really not good, but these are great. So you work with Emily. Yes. Emily's a past student of mine that I saw when Barry had his thing back there. Did Emily train you partly? Yes. Yeah. How many, I saw in the video, there looked like a lot of people in the mm -hmm. background and a lot of pens. Tell me how many people at one time could you find out there and how many pens there are? Um, so we do play groups uh, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, we generally have in between 30 and 40 dogs. Um, every day that come through. Um, we've seen many different breeds. These, all of the pictures that you saw in here, other than this yang, yin yang photo and the videos, are all dogs that have been at play groups, um, hence why I kind of knew their names. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, all of these dogs here. How about people? How many people are supervising? Oh, um, we have pretty much four to six supervisors. Okay. We try to stick one per uh, 